Hey, aloha, everybody, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studio for another exciting episode of Security Matters. I uh, hope your Tuesday is going well. I hope your post-pandemic efforts are um, helping you get back to some sort of new normal. We're going to kind of get to what normal might be looking like. We'll, we'll, um, we'll kind of take a future look near the end of the show at what uh, uh, maybe what the, some of the security trends that are happening around the island might, might foretell anyway. Uh, my guest today, Ed Howard, is brilliant, um, as you're going to find out. I think Ed's been on before, but he's um, is, was in a, he's in a different role now. So he's um, in the middle of uh, the pandemic, actually. He um, retired from his previous role and started uh, consulting uh, work out here in Hawaii. And it's great because we really don't have an active uh, consulting uh, community here like they have on the mainland. So Ed brings a lot of wisdom uh, and experience to that role. And he's... Um, been out and about in Hawaii, so we're going to see what he's been up to. Ed, thanks so much for joining me today. I know you're busy, and I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to join us here and share a little bit with our community. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. No worries. Well, let's give um, some of the folks who may not know you. Um, a lot of folks in the industry watch the show um, uh, on the mainland, so maybe uh, you know as much of your history as you want to share. I know we don't give everything away on social media these days, but um, as much as you can sort of walk us through and uh, bring us up to uh, your present work with uh, Pac Fellow. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm actually, the way I look at it is I'm kind of coming on my last ride of my career. Um, this is actually like kind of my third career, so to speak. Uh, uh, you know, I had law enforcement for 26 years, and then the uh, last 15 years, it's been in security management and healthcare. And um, I, I decided in October of this past year to retire from my corporate job and um, really do what I always wanted to do, which was own my own business, one, and two, you know, help people in the industry and uh, share my wisdom, my knowledge, and my experience. So this is kind of a dream come true for me and something that I'm embracing and I'm uh, really happy with. That's awesome. Yeah, and you, um, you were doing a lot of outreach, actually, um, you know, in your role uh, with the, from the healthcare industry. I recall, I know you did some, some training at one of the shows that we put on. Um, I think you were uh, really, I think, insightful for helping people understand the sort of violence that can occur in the healthcare uh, workspace. Um, can you talk about that a little bit, how, how you were able to share some of that with uh, the healthcare community in Hawaii? Yeah, sure. So as I as I mentioned earlier, the last 15 years, I've, I've been in, uh, you know, what I would call a specialty of healthcare security and safety. And, um, you know, as I mentioned in your previous show, in my presentations that I do, um, healthcare, uh, one of the uh, major concerns in healthcare and in healthcare setting and environment is workplace violence. And it is something that has been uh, trending up over the years and it's something that is now being uh, highly regulated uh, in particular in California and it's just uh, plans and processes and procedures that we need to build around on so I've been able to share a lot of my experience you know building these plans and procedures and implementing programs uh, to help uh, mitigate the issues with workplace violence. Yeah, and that's a, you know, re related to the pandemic, I, I remember, um, you know, folks getting, you know, we saw this was sort of in the paper and in the media that, you know, people would get um, sick and then get isolated and then their family couldn't even talk to them and people were enraged that they couldn't be there at the end. And I, it's such a, the healthcare environment is, there, there's so much emotion going on there for the people. Do you, in your experience, is that a, that emotionality that occurs, is that kind of unique to the healthcare space and maybe maybe a bar fight? I don't know if there's a comparable comparable area where that that level of people just don't even recognize in themselves how how heightened their behavior become. Yeah, absolutely. And but let me address the COVID um, comment oh, that you made, um, which, which was really interesting is as COVID ramped up and started to spread out and become a, a really major concern of ours. You know, the security officers working in the healthcare facilities were placed on the front line to, mm. to actually, you know, give out the word of no visitors allowed. So if you can imagine wow. that, wow. Uh, you know, following those marching orders, 
And, um, you know, it was all for good reason too, obviously. Yeah. Um, sure. But when you try to explain that there's no visitors allowed and you have a loved one in the hospital, um, workplace violence really skyrocketed, skyrocketed at that point from, you know, really strong verbal abuse to physical contact. So uh, those healthcare security officers, uh, I have to commend uh, on the front line uh, enforcing an almost impossible standard, so to speak, or direction, and uh, really took a toll on a, on a lot of a lot of them. Um, as far as you know, healthcare in itself, uh, yes, there are many external type uh, risks and factors that come into the healthcare setting um, that drive emotion, and it mm. can be you know someone that might be. Um, you know, besides being very sick or or having a, a medical issue, you know, yeah, you have homelessness and you have drug abuse and you know you have gangs and you have all different types of external factors that come into the healthcare setting wow. that cause um, a lot of emotional reactions and uh, behaviors. So it's just a dynamic um, type of uh, atmosphere and environment that uh, you learn to. Uh, or you specifically get trained and learned how to work in those type of environments. Is um, <clears throat> is the focus on that that escalation that can occur with people? And you know, when you're trying to trying to help mitigate violence, and you know, the worker from getting injured, right? Who has to do their job? Um, I remember, you know, when we did, uh, I did Navy police work, but we would like drunk people would swing kind of wildly in their in their emotionality. Like it can be super calm, and then the next minute crazy. Is the that emotion that goes along with the like medical type concerns or that environment? Is it more of a slower type escalation, or do people just go go off because they're so stressed and they're trying to control themselves, or do you have just a the complete range? I I just don't know how you could be aware, you know, of that that escalation problem, you know, coming at you right when you got so many other concerns you know if you're an officer there on the front line and trying to hold the door and a bunch of people you know wanting to get inside right like that's a that's a critical situation for a worker uh, i guess the word would be unpredictable yeah uh, but but being prepared so um you know when i used to train my officers um and and this goes across the nation in healthcare security people who really know the industry and know uh, what the uh, risks are and the vulnerabilities out there specific to violence, uh, we all prepare for it. And it's mm. down to the training of not only your clinical staff, but your security. And it's uh, very specific signs. It's uh, escalation signs. It's, uh, it, it actually, believe it or not, it's, it's actually your service that's being provided to a mm. lot of individuals as well. So customer service or what we call patient satisfaction. Um, there's so many um, components and variables that, uh, that play into it. And you really got to try to um, keep an even kill with everything to help you manage, you know, that type of uh, environment. Wow. So did, um, did you see, uh, you mentioned that it was very difficult for a lot of the officers. So did it during the pandemic, did a lot of folks choose to maybe change their career path or, or, or were they, um, did you have to augment the training or augment the shift so that they weren't so exposed, you know, cause this was a long, it wasn't like this only lasted for a few days or a few weeks. This was a over a year, you know, I mean, really, uh, diff difficult situation for everyone on, on all sides. Right. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. And I can tell you, um, and this is not only happening in healthcare, it's happening mm. across the whole industry as well is that you know the need and the demand for more security uh just con has continued throughout mm. uh the covid pro you know the covid pandemic situation and um you know a lot of it is because there is a lot of emotion involved um there's a lot of compliance and enforcement of rules that that your your average uh worker is not going to do it, mm. it needs someone who uh, has the special specialty in doing it or the experience in, in those type of confrontations, mm. um, you know, not only providing good customer service, but there's going to be times where you need to be somewhat confrontational to enforce rules and to, you know, get compliance. And that usually is just security is relied upon to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So um, as we talk about when COVID started, um, you know, the security industry in Hawaii did not fade out. As a matter of fact, it became more robust because of mm. the various screening, the various of, uh, rules and regulations compliance, even though businesses went down, um, those businesses, businesses that were open and that were implementing uh, COVID uh, practices and restrictions on certain things still needed those, those processes to be enforced mm -hmm. and to, to have compliance. And a lot of times they had to bring in security, sometimes not to actually be involved in the screening process, but to be that strong security presence um, because you did have people that got upset or got, you know, got angry about um, the, the whole entire changes and the way things are you know, managed with this and particularly healthcare. So yeah. um, we, we lost a lot of officers, but we also gained a lot. And um, there, it came to a point where you know, we had to really up the training as well. Wow, good. Well, I'm, I'm glad that our, our community responded. You know, we're the Aloha State, and it's, um, it, it's not a, a situation that um, fosters Aloha, you might say, when you have to tell everybody, look, I'm sorry, but I have to do my job, and you're, you have to leave now, or this door is closed to you, or whatever it may be. Right. So that's a really difficult, I'm sure, for a, a lot of the frontline officers. Right. Um, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, as far as the COVID in the industry here in Hawaii, the COVID situation, saw some very interesting things. So one, uh, we had security managers and directors and we had supervisors because of laid off staff, particularly in the hotel industry, mm. hospitality industry. We had them still working, but they were now taking on the frontline role. So we had them oh. bike, bicycle patrols. We had them patrolling um, the property to ensure that uh, you know things were being kept kept well and safe and secure. So you know we had that type of we had to we had to mm. kind of uh, change up um, and adapt to what was going on you know out there in this in in the whole changing world at the time and continues to this day. Uh, the other interesting thing we saw is as they started to hire more security because it was specific to COVID. We started to get people that had never worked in the industry before. Mm. So that that was your bartenders, right, and your wait waiters, and others that had lost their jobs during the time. So what we were starting to see is a workforce coming in that was very inexperienced. Mm. So training, 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 oversight, monitoring, um, you know, getting your post orders and all those things down right, so they were comfortable in performing the job and were able to perform the job. So those those were some some of the dynamic things that was, was happening so we could adapt to what was going on in this wow. Yeah. wow, that's awesome. That's um well I'm I'm glad we've gotten as far as we've gotten. I'm uh I'm shocked we've been on this for 15 minutes, but we're we're about midway. We're gonna take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll get into what things might look like heading up the road. We'll be right back with Ed Howard. Stick around. we're back and we're talking with Ed Howard and we've been kind of kicking around what what the security industry was like in Hawaii during the pandemic. Um, Ed, as we as we sort of move forward, what are what are you seeing and what do you what do you think is going to happen next with this workforce and and security in Hawaii in general? 
I think the workforce is going to expand more as far as security is concerned, because as you got your businesses opening up, uh, in particular, the hospitality industry, food service, and those types of things, uh, we are going to see uh, opportunities for more security hires. The contract security companies out there will be uh, entertaining more contracts. Um, so I think that's going to be a good thing. Uh, we are going to lose uh, the people that have come into the industry, let's call it on a temporary basis, uh, mm. as they get called back to their other jobs. So we're, we're seeing that as well. Um, wow. And we are also facing, as any other industry out there, that there is there is a lack of applicants because of what's happening with subsistence from our government. But mm. as that starts to fade away, I think we'll, we'll, we'll start to see more um, employees or people looking for jobs in the security industry. Uh, do you think other avenues other than like patrol and um, you sort of like guard duty, guard services, do you think um, will there be an increase also in the technology investment as we as we get back and people are looking, you know, we, we saw a little bit of an influx, you know, for example, of the, um, you know, the, the, the temperature monitoring and the mask detection and all and the, the way to ask, you know, your guests to answer the questions, you know, have you had COVID or have you been in contact with anybody? All that sort of technology sort of showed up in the, the front offices or in the, the visitor uh, spaces, you know, at a lot of places. Um, do you think we'll continue to see uh, some investment in technology or do you think technology helped us play a role in, in, in getting a little better security going, uh, you know, related to the pandemic? Well, what I found out in which, which really fits well in my consulting role is what I have found out dealing with clients over the years and, and recently is technology is usually not something they know about. Yeah. Um, yeah, they know about a camera and they, they know about a monitor, but they truly don't know, um, you know, how security can help enhance or, or you know, um, technology can help security and enhance it. So a lot of it is education. And mm. when I do point out the various tools that are out there or the various technology solutions that are out there, they, they usually are pretty amazed with it. And so mm. I'll come up as a consultant and talk to them about um, about that. And it, not everything is guard manpower, right? Not everything is guard force. It's how do we blend those things together? Um, so my biggest... Um, things that I have been reached out by from clients is how to address homelessness is number one. Mm. Um, uh, any, any type of violence, uh, a lot of my clients are now asking for security awareness training and personal protection. Mm. Um, mm. These are businesses that are concerned about their employees and not necessarily is crime increasing, but it is becoming more um, advertised, so to speak, or it's becoming more of news. Um, a lot of times, I think you may know this, that people get emotional when something happens or there's knee-jerk reactions to things. And a lot of that goes back to just doing, uh, you know, very simple general security assessments and other types of vulnerability assessments to help you to understand what you're actually facing and what, what are those risks and vulnerabilities out there. So. Those are the type of things that I'm getting. It's all conducive to what's happening out in our environment. Um, and uh, a lot of times it's just a lot of education. And I come away very pleased when I talk to a client and I'm able, able to educate them on things that they've never heard of before or never thought of. And um, they see security in a whole different light after that. And they see that there's hope. And that's, that's really what I like about what I'm doing. Yeah, it's, it's awesome to share that to our, our industry is, you know, those of us, the practitioners in our industry know we're at the end of the day, protecting lives and protecting assets, right? And so we take that to heart, but the, how we do that and how that comes across to the end users, you know, the, the, that need security and don't often think about, you know, the, the, the risks that are there, you know, day in and day out, they may see someone hanging around and not know that they're being cased, for example, or something like that. You know, they just, I just don't think it's top of mind. And do, do you find that, um, I've, I've talked with other people that, that felt that, you know, security is like, um, it's kind of like uh, that, that insurance bill, right? Like you, you, you have to pay your insurance bill, but you, you rarely ever use it. And you, you really don't like to have to think about it. And I'm, I wonder if security um, is, 
is not top of mind for for people who don't work in the space all the time you know because of that you know is it just is it just a, leaves you a little bit uneasy to have to think that you are at risk you know instead of you know keeping your head on the swivel all the time and is it maybe it's just too stressful for for most people what's your what's your thoughts on that with the clients that you talk to no and, and it's not top of mind um on a, on a daily basis like it would be for myself and you and others in the industry we look through things we look at things through a different lens with mm. security uh, for majority of my clients and businesses that i've been talking to it's usually back burner stuff mm -hmm. or it's you know when something bad happens right and now yeah. all of a sudden we got to do things so when i come in and consult and i talk to them um, you know i talk to them about taking ownership of of security and taking ownership of your property and taking ownership of, of um, things to do to create a secure and safe environment. And there's just so many things out there you can do rather than always number one, call 911, call 911, call 911. Yeah. Please, they are part of the solutions and they're part of managing, you know, your your issues. Um, but but it, it kind of has to start with a commitment. And again, it goes back to that education. There's just so much out there that uh, businesses, CEOs, um, and others, uh, just it's a new world for them. So educating them is, is key. Well, that um, we may we may just have to set you up on stage and let you just do this like all the time. Like at, maybe you should have a weekly sort of um, CEO, you know, call to security because I, I don't think they know, you know, to your point, a lot of the, you know, the, the policy and procedure and all the things that they can do. There's no, it's like you have to go buy something, you know, there's all these things that they can do internally to help their staff, you know, protect themselves and be aware of what's going on in the environment, you know, uh, immediately in their office and, you know, right, right there nearby. Um, you know, we all, well, all the times we talk about, you know, if we, if we save one life, you know, we did our job. If we stop some someone from getting injured you know we did our job and that's that's the whole point and it, it can happen instantly i think i think that um a lot of the business owners are so focused on their business all the time that they don't they don't build security into their the way that they practice their business and so therefore they kind of leave their employees vulnerable and they don't mean to do that it's just again not top of mind um how how is your training received are you um are you i think i saw a video you had uh it looked like maybe 10 or 15 people in a class. I'm not sure what, what you were teaching on that one, but what sort of requests are you getting for uh, training some of these businesses? I think that's a great service. Yeah, no, I, um, well, the, the one I think you're referring to was some uh, loss prevention training for store oh, detectives. Awesome. Uh, um, that one. Yeah, the training I'm getting is it, or a request for is, um, you know, act, active shooter and active uh, assailant, mm. assailant uh, responses, uh, workplace violence personal protection, security awareness. Um, you know, those are kind of the, the big ones. Um, as far as the consulting part of it, it's it's number one, again, as I go back to the homeless population, which, you know, mm -hmm. is, is unfortunate. It does have an impact on businesses and, and a lot of people. Um, but, um, you know, there's a lot of strategies that you can work with and, and, and things that you can do. So, I, I get a lot of requests for that. That's probably my top one right right now. Wow. Awesome. Well, that seems to be a problem that, you know, I've, I've watched, I don't know how many administrations come through here. And nobody seems to have the solution yet. So that, you, yeah, yeah. you found some job security there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's real simple solutions uh, as, as well. And sometimes they're a little more difficult where you got to have police intervention more than you probably want to. But um, you, you go in with a plan and, you know, you, you show the respect and the interactions are positive. Um, you know, it, it, it can send a good, strong, positive message. That's awesome. So you, are you available um, to do these trainings on site primarily or do you do them? Um, are you going to like advertise some classes and maybe host them at, at UH, you know, or something like that? Is that the, do you see that sort of demand? I, I think that there's a need there. I think it's always been there. So hopefully... Um, that's a service that uh, people take advantage of if you can scale that up. Yeah, I think that might be something that I can look at down the road. But um, right now, what's actually happening, which is I'm fortunate with, is the businesses that I am working with, I'm crafting uh, very specific training for them in their mm. workforce. Uh, so kind of customizing uh, by working with them on, on training. And, and it can really... You know, doing it that way too uh, really helps to get to the core 
issues of the company and what they want to see and how they want to uh, roll it out with their employees. Yeah, I, I like the custom approach. I've always said that every security solution is site specific, right? And so I do think that managers and non, non security practitioners can take some of the sort of generic information that's out there from DHS or FBI or whatever it may be. And but but they may miss some of the nuances for how to apply it within their facility. So it's good. So good that you're, you're going on site and helping these yeah. guys build, build something that really addresses their people. Right. And one thing that I always tell my consultants, and I even put this in my assessment reports, is, is you know, I commend these organizations and these businesses that seek out the assistance and the help, because that is a major step. So when you have businesses that do that, they, they want an assessment, they want to know what the current state and they want to know what the vulnerabilities and risks and problems are, so they can make informed decisions or they can, you know, they can either accept risks or they can mitigate them or deal with them. Um, I really commend that. And that's one of the things I always do when I when I go to my meetings and I interact with the CEOs and and uh, other administration and leadership. Sure. Yeah, security definitely has to come from the top. But well, we've got a minute or so left. Uh, maybe some final advice for our Hawaii community as we get out of the pandemic? Well, we're heading in the right direction, obviously, right? So we are going to see a lot of things opening. We're going to see more opportunities for the security industry. Um, I, I, I see bright futures ahead, bright future ahead. And uh, we still want to obviously be safe and follow the protocols and precautions that are out there because, you know, this. This may not ever go away or, you know, it'll take longer than we think. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll continue to uh, work on those issues and educate yourself, I think, is the big thing. Or take the opportunities to learn more about, um, you know, security and what you can do to protect yourself, not only individually, but your businesses. I love it, Ed. Thanks so much for the advice. And thanks for sharing uh, time with us today and time with our community. Everybody stay safe out there and uh, we'll see you next Tuesday. Uh, Aloha.